Hi everyone, it's Sharon Kelly from the Berwick Public Library. Who doesn't love a good mystery? And thanks to the partnership with Berwick Community TV, our next guest is an author that wrote a four book series, soon to be five, that we have here at the library. Charlene Devanzo is a marine ecologist. She's also a former college professor. She stopped teaching so she could focus on her writing and she has come up with an incredible series of mystery and environmental issues. She lives in Maine, in Yarmouth. With her husband, she enjoys sea kayaking and she's passionate about the environment. So stay tuned to learn all about this great new series at the Berwick Library. Welcome, Charlene. Hi. I'm Charlene Devonzo, and I'm here to tell you about my climate change mysteries. I'm a scientist, a marine ecologist, who turned to writing mysteries about six years ago or so. And that's my story that I'd like to tell you about. Um, at this point, there are four books in my mystery series. Cold Blood, Hot Sea, Demon Spirit, Devil Sea, Secrets Haunt, The Lobster Sea, and Glass Eel, Shattered Sea. As you can see, the, <laughs> there is a theme um, throughout uh, my series. They all take place in the ocean, mostly on the main coast. And there's a lot of boats in my, my uh, series, especially sea kayaks. I'm a very avid sea kayaker. So what I'll talk about, why and how I transform myself from a scientist professor to an environmental mystery writer, why would I ever write something called cli-fi? climate fiction. And what is climate fiction? Why I write mysteries, and I'll talk a little bit of, at the end about the Gulf of Maine warming, which is key to one of my books, and I'll have a very brief reading from my first book. So about 10 years or so ago, I was a professor at Hampshire College in Western Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, ecology teacher, and I absolutely love my job. I love my students. I got to do neat things like growing tilapia in a solar greenhouse. I had no plans at all to leave my position. Um, then one day I traveled up the road to the University of Massachusetts, which is the state school for Massachusetts in Amherst, uh, to hear a talk by Ray Bradley. So Ray is the director of Climate Systems Research Center at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And he does, uh, he takes ice cores, and that's, those are the data in the back of this slide here. Um, and he looks at those ice cores to understand historically what the climate has been in the world, back very far with, with these ice cores. So that's what I expected Ray to talk about, his research, his, his climate change research. But he didn't talk about that at all. Instead, Ray talked about a letter from the Congressional House Committee in Washington, D.C., referring to methodological flaws and data errors in studies you co-authored co of the historical record of temperature and climate change. And then the committee, this committee, had a list of demands. The first one was pretty straightforward, lists all your financial uh, support related to the work. But the second one, location of all the data archives for your research, including calculations, computer source code, validation information, things like that. Now, that would be a tremendously difficult thing for any scientist to produce because that stuff is all over in archives and there's a lot of it. So um, Ray wrote a book, and I'm going to be referring to uh, several books here in, uh, in the presentation that if, if you'd like to take a look at. Uh, he wrote a book called Global Warming and Political Intimidation, published in 2012 by the UMass Press. And in, in the prologue, he said, politicians sought to discredit my reputation and that of other climatologists and to intimidate us because of the so-called hockey stick graph, which my colleagues Michael Mann and Malcolm Hughes and I published in the journal Nature in 1998. We concluded that temperatures in recent years were the warmest in a thousand years. So I'd like to tell you what about, I'll show you what this hockey stick graph is and a little bit about what uh, he's talking about. 
So the hockey stick. As you can see, it actually looks like a hockey stick, the data. This is uh, one, the year 1000. This is present day. Um, and the blue marks here are proxy data for temperature because people weren't back in the year 1000 recording temperature, obviously. And so that's, those are data gotten from um, tree rings, corals, ice cores. Uh, the historical rec records are in recent and actual measurements are in red. And so these are, it's kind of shaped like a hockey stick. Um, it was featured in the United Nations IPCC reports, and that's probably where the um, politicians in Washington, D.C. saw it. Again, another book that I would recommend for this, Michael Mann, who's been in the newspaper quite a bit, in the press quite a bit, talking about all of this, uh, The Hockey Stick and Climate Wars by Michael Mann, Dispatches from the Frontline. He's a climatologist uh, and Penn State uh, Earth System Science Center director, and a very good guy. Um, Ray also talked about, Ray Bradley also talked about um, a powerful ploy that uh, climate change deniers use, which is to sully the reputation of climate scientists. So I'd like to say a little bit about why that's so important. If we don't have our reputations as scientists, we don't have anything, because we need other uh, scientists to respect us, to work with us, uh, to look at our grant proposals and judge them, to publish with us, all of that. Reputation is just absolutely key to being a scientist. So selling the reputation of any scientist is a very serious thing. Uh, Ray went on to describe another tactic that climate change deniers use, denial and doubt. I don't believe in climate warming. So unfortunately, um, this uh, tactic continues today. Our president saying, I'm not a believer in global warming. Now the word believe is to me as a scientist is a very odd word to use there. You don't believe in a phenomenon. As a scientist, you have data to support it or not to support it. So uh, you say, well, this might be happening, or we're pretty confident that this is happening. We don't say believe or not believe. So um, this kind of tactic is something that we've seen before. Um, this, we, some of us who are of a certain age might remember now, this is in 1998, tobacco executives testifying before the U.S. Congress that nicotine wasn't addictive, even though uh, information looking back shows that they absolutely knew that nicotine was addictive in uh, cigarettes. So another book that I would recommend, um, Naomi Oreskes' Merchants of Doubt, um, in which she says climate change deniers doubt is their product. Uh, she's very passionate about this. It's a really terrific book. How a handful of scientists obscure the truth on issues from tobacco smoke to global warming. Of course, statements like these that I referred to discredit climate scientists. And this cartoon says, is global warming real? And the scientist says, he's in you know, the white coat. Of course, just ask the global warming fairy. Now, it's really important to emphasize that scientists agree that climate change is human caused. So Jim Powell put together, uh, he's a geochemist uh, from MIT, uh, worked in the Reagan and Bush administration. He put together uh, a paper in which he looked at uh, over 11,000 scientific research studies about climate change. The consensus was 100% um, that our, clam our climate is changing and Obviously, the papers had different takes on that. So the scientists who really know what's going on, who are working this, are pretty confident that something is going on. So um, Jim Powell also wrote a book called The Inquisition of Climate Science. And in his prologue, he said, I think it's time for scientists to get up from the lab bench and speak out. I want my grandchildren to be able to say, he tried hard to do something. Um, I've communicated with uh, Jim Powell, and he's a really terrific guy, been very helpful to me. Um, I really like that statement. I want my grandchildren to be able to say that he tried hard to do something. 
because it's kind of unusual for scientists to step out of the lab or research field or where, where they're into uh, the public and talk about this. It's not something that we're, many of us are used to doing. So back to Ray Bradley. Remember I was in, I was in an auditorium at the University of Massachusetts listening to Ray talk about all this stuff. And after the talk I left, went outside. I remember this so clearly. I was standing outside. I was pretty upset and that this was happening to this guy who's a really great guy. should not be happening to him. He's being harassed by uh, climate change deniers in Washington, D.C. And this is what was going through my mind. Scientists aren't reaching the public by traditional means. We need to do something very different. And then I thought, well, people love stories. Mysteries would be a great vehicle to talk about climate change and climate change denial. I could write a mystery that features a climate scientist. Now, I want you to realize that this was an absolutely insane idea for me to do. It just came out of the blue. This is an image of a kayak going over a waterfall that's, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of feet long. So it, it kind of makes sense to me in terms of what I'm talking about. It would be crazy for me to be writing a mystery, especially a mystery series. Write a mystery? I'd never written fiction in my whole life at all. There were some positives. I do like to write. I'd written a lot of papers and proposals, and I understand the mechanics and discipline of writing. For instance, that writing is really a lot about rewriting. I could use my experience as a marine ecologist and a sea kayaker. I was in the business of of explaining complicated things simply. And I'm definitely passionate about the natural world. Also, there were a lot of negatives. I had no experience writing fiction. I knew nothing about the craft of mystery writing. I was told things like, I need an agent and a publisher, but I didn't know what they really even were. I knew nobody who was a mystery writer about the associations of mystery writers and all that. So I really like this uh, saying. It kind of makes sense to me in, in the context of what happened. It's impossible, says pride. It's risky, said experience. It's pointless, said reason. Give it a try, answered the heart. So I did. So within uh, not too long, actually the end of that same semester, I retired early from Hampshire College to write, to learn how to write mysteries. I moved from Amherst, Massachusetts to the coast of Maine, a place I knew and loved, uh, to be closer to the ocean. And I also have a lot of friends uh, in Maine. And um, I've, as I have mentioned, I have a mystery series now with four books and another one coming along, which I'll mention a little bit later. I'll tell you a bit about them. The first book, Cold Blood, Hot Sea, that one um, is, which I'll read from, uh, the, that one is, talks about climate change deniers and what it does to uh, my protagonist especially. Uh, she's an oceanographer called Mara Toscani. She features, she's in all my books. Um, Demon Spirit Devil Sea actually doesn't take place in Maine. It takes place in Haida Gwaii off British Columbia. And there, which I've traveled to, it's absolutely a gorgeous uh, temperate rainforest. Lots of wonderful sea kayaking, of course. Um, there, the Haida people were talked into pouring, if you can believe this, red slurry, iron slurry, into the water because an entrepreneur from the United States convinced them that this could help with climate change. Um, I was really interested why people who are, who are so close to nature would do such a thing. Um, Secrets Haunt the Lobster Sea is back in Maine. It features warming in the Gulf of Maine and what's happening with that in terms of lobsters and lobstering. And I'd like to say I, I really respect lobstermen, the people who are out there on the water all the time. They know what's going on with warming and are concerned about what's going to happen to them. The, the last book, uh, Glass Eels Shattered Sea, uh, that feels features uh, a fish called glass eels, and they swim up rivers in the spring in Maine. Maine is one of the few places that allows uh, people to net them, you net them, and um, they 
fetch an, a lot of money, which is why people are so interested in, um, in getting them. Something like a couple thousand pounds, dollars a pound uh, in the past. Uh, they're, they're sent, the eels are sent to uh, places like Japan and China and put in ponds to grow up uh, to be big eels and they're made into sushi. What I was interested in glass eels was uh, trafficking of glass eels because they m get so much money. I'd never heard of anything like that, you know, trafficking of, of a fish called glass eels. So I was uh, interested to explore that. Uh, the next book in this series, I'm not sure what it's going to be about, but uh, there's been a, a horrible thing that happened uh, in Maine recently where a, a lovely woman was swimming uh, in Harpswell area and she was attacked by a shark um, and uh, died uh, just from swimming in the water. And there's something there that I'd like to look at in terms of a, uh, a book. I'm not sure what the mystery is going to be, but I love to learn a lot about sharks. I know nothing about them and the, and the creatures that they go after. So, uh, cli-fi, climate fiction, what it is. Just the names of a couple of books that are cli-fi books. Um, Margaret Atwood, The Year of the Flood, uh, against, uh, Odds Against Tomorrow by Nathaniel Rich, New York 2140, The Water Knife. And uh, Barbara uh, Kingsolver's Flight Behavior is one a book that I really uh, admire. You'll remember uh, Barbara Kingsolver, who's written Bean Trees and Poisonwood Bible, and among other books. Um, the reason I like flight, be flight behavior, which takes place in Appalachia, is that it features a woman called Delarobia who sees a, a, a hillside covered with butterflies, beautiful monarch butterflies, which have traveled there from their usual overwintering place in Mexico because of the changing climate. And Delarobia uh, meets a scientist working on this and completely changed her. She didn't know anything about this or science or anything. And it changes her attitude. And she actually becomes a scientist at the end of the book, studying climate change. Great book. Uh, in regard to Cli-Fi, Margaret Atwood said, people need such stories because however dark a darkness with voices in it is better than a silent void. The goals for my own book and the series would be that leaders, readers learn about climate change in the context of a fast-paced, engaging story. They're immersed in the everyday lives of researchers, scientists they relate to, including harassment by doubters, for example. And that readers can smell, hear, taste, and otherwise delight in the natural world. Um, another way I say it is I like to get readers in, under, and on the ocean. You know, in scuba diving, uh, one of my books features actually uh, submarines, um, obviously sea kayaking, and every kind of boat you can imagine, uh, lobster boats, and uh, oceanograph oceanographic research vessels like this one. Um, the Glass Eels books actually takes uh, Mara Toscani and her colleagues um, down to the Sargasso Sea, which is a large area here, you can see. It's, it's, it's one of the, I think it's the only uh, sea that's enclosed completely by uh, currents, like the Gulf Stream. And um, eels, the glass eels, travel all the way from Maine, all the way down the coast of the U.S., and then out to the Sargasso Sea where they mate, and nobody has ever witnessed this. And then the young seals uh, drift, the larvae drift up, the coast become eels and then travel north to uh, Maine and the other rivers again. They go up the rivers along the coast. The Sargasso Sea is a, an amazing place. It's covered with sargassum, which is a seaweed, warm, beautiful. And I was lucky enough when I was a graduate student in Woods Hole to travel there, so I have a lot of memories of it. Okay, why fiction? Why would, again, why would a scientist who never wrote fiction turn to fiction. Why, why that? Um, and some co colleagues have asked me, especially, why would you write fiction in the age of fake news? 
Edward Wilson, E.O. Wilson from Harvard, I think put it really well why you'd write fiction. People respect nonfiction, but they read novels. Uh, novels have been very important for social change. For instance, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. In 1852, the novel that helped, it was the novel that helped lay the groundwork for the Civil War. It was the best-selling book of the 19th century, second only to the Bible. And why are these books so popular and important? And I think it's because people care about the characters. Um, people care about Uncle Tom, and that's why they cared about what happened to him. Okay, why mysteries in particular? Um, they're very popular. Mysteries are e extremely popular. I think they're second to romances only in their popularity for fiction. Uh, people enjoy the whodunit part of it uh, as they sift through the clues and try to figure out what's going on. Um, a good mystery highlights the best and worst in people. Greed and revenge, but also generosity and selfishness, selflessness. Um, death, the one thing we can't escape, makes tr uh, sense as the truth is discovered. And why I like mysteries is because uh, detectives and amateur sleuths like scientists, they solve puzzles, they solve puzzles. They collect data and analyze the, uh, and they work with clues, they analyze the data and the evidence. Um, I can reveal the best and worst in people, greed and revenge, but also selflessness and courage. And m mysteries are a genre that I, I've read, I read a lot of mysteries. It's a genre that I know well and really enjoy. So uh, I'd like to end here with talking a little bit about the Gulf of Maine uh, and that it's warming. So uh, the Gulf of Maine is a large uh, kind of circular area between Cape Cod and Canada. And um, it's pretty shallow. Uh, and there's its connection to uh, the Atlantic Ocean over here. It's just a narrow strip like that. Um, and the reason why uh, the Gulf of Maine is warming is that the currents have changed out here uh, because of melting of glaciers from above, the fresh water coming down. And because of that, the Gulf Stream has moved a little bit farther north, and some of that warm water slips into the Gulf of Maine uh, and warms it up. And the, and also, because it's getting warmer here uh, in Maine as in elsewhere, the, it, the uh, surface water is warming up as a re just a result of that. Uh, over the past decade, the sea surface temperatures in the Gulf of Maine have increased faster than 99% of the ocean. This is amazing. Um, Andrew Persing from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute uh, put that together and published it in a journal, a very famous journal called Science in 2015. I've heard him talk about that. And he said he was just amazed that, that, that this was the case, that the Gulf of Maine is, temperatures are increasing faster than almost 99% of the global ocean. So why is the Gulf of Maine uh, warming so fast? Uh, as I said, in the past, the northern cold water of the Labrador Current easily surged into the Gulf uh, keeping it warm, but now melting of glacier ice near Greenland has altered the currents. Um, climate change will probably have a drastic effect on the Gulf of Maine lobsters uh, industry and other industries like clams. Right now, uh, there's a lot of lobsters being caught in the Gulf of Maine, for instance, off of Stonington. So we're right about here in this graph. But it's, it's, that's not going to uh, happen always. The lobsters are going to, it's going to become too warm for the lobsters. And they're starting to move north already. And it's not that the adult lobsters walk along the bottom and go north, uh, which is kind of what you think of when, when you say they're moving north. It's that the larvae of, of the lobsters uh, don't survive in the warm water and uh, that's how they move north. So, um, I'd like to read, oh, uh, Secrets Haunt the Lobster Sea is an example of how I immerse uh, readers in the 
science and consequences of climate change. Um, the Gulf of Maine, as I said, is warming very rapidly. And what I uh, look at in the book is the impacts of warming on the Gulf of Maine and the, and the fisheries and the lobstermen. So um, I would like to end with some cautious optimism. Um, right now, we have uh, a lot of debates going on, po political debates going on, because we have an election coming up. And I've never heard uh, politicians talk about warming and climate change and the phenomenon, for instance, the fires that are happening out west right now. Uh, as much as they are now. So this is something that really is coming to the fore that people care about and want to know about. So that does offer a little bit of optimism in terms of action being taken uh, in the future. So I'd like to end here uh, with a little reading from my first book, Cold Blood Hot Sea. So, um, in this, uh, where I'm reading you uh, in the book is right at the beginning. Mara Toscani and her colleagues are on an oceanographic research vessel heading out. Uh, and she has, she's gone, she gets seasick. She's an oceanographer who gets seasick. Um, and so she's gone down actually to uh, the computer lab to check out her emails and stuff like that. And so, uh, this is the segment. A half a dozen computers ran along one side of the main deck laboratory. I slipped into the one of the mismatched chairs. My friend Peter, my dear friend Peter, the youngest PhD on board, clicked away at the keyboard next to me. Hey, Peter, I said, how are Sarah and the twins? Focused on the computer, he furrowed his brow. Peter, what on earth is the matter? He held both sides of the monitor as if it might take off, and he turned toward me. There's a bizarre email here. Hold on while I read it through. I logged onto the NOAA weather site for the Gulf of Maine. A low pressure system would bring squally weather faster than predicted. Winds 15 to 20 knots, swells 8 feet. My hand went to my stomach. I skimmed my emails. The subject line, climate change scientists fudge data of course, caught my eye. I leaned forward to read. Email exchanges show that climate change scientists create their own heat by cooking the data. The, the researchers' words, transforming the data, removing outliers, prove what the Prospect Institute has shown a long time. So-called global warming is a manufactured fiction. I turned to Peter. Are you reading scientists' fudge data? He swiveled his chair to face me. His dark eyes narrowed, black as the storm racing towards us. Yeah, and this one really might get us. But everybody knows that the Prospect Institute's nuts claim that smoking isn't a problem, there's no acid rain, ozone isn't depleted. They're just not a credible source. Transforming, transforming data, removing outliers, that's just statistical lingo for data analysis. It doesn't mean we're fixing the numbers. I reread the message and stared at him. Like an athlete's doping scandal, this could ruin scientists' career in a heartbeat. And the harassment could be horrific. In Australia, climate change deniers had to move after radical deniers threatened their families. And there's something else, Mara, Peter said. At the bottom of the email is a list of the 10 hacked scientists and you're number seven. And with that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>